All right. Content warning, racism, homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, hate crimes, police violence, fascist iconography, the Holocaust. Say right. for the sake of argument, there's this... Call him a provocateur? A conservative who makes his living off being a public figure, saying scandalously evil things in public because controversy equals attention, and attention equals yep. brand recognition. He gets his writing gigs and interviews and guest spots, sometimes because people agree with the awful things he says. More often, it's because he gets views. His economy runs on engagement, and hate clicks are still clicks. One revenue stream is speaking engagements, the college campus circuit. Fans at, let's say... He's literally just describing Matt Walsh. A UC Emeryville. Invite him as a guest lecturer. Or Ben Shapiro. But UCE is broadly a progressive campus, which means his presence there would likely provoke a lot of outrage. Maybe even a protest. And a protest... would be pretty flippin' sweet! Protest means local news coverage. Maybe more than local. Hell, the conservative media machine loves taking stories like this and blowing them up to national importance. If he plays his cards right, he could get his words in front of millions of people instead of just the student body of UC Emeryville. Of course he's going to take that gig. But the progressive students at UCE are wise to his tricks. They've seen him pull this stunt at other UCs, Stockton, Bakersfield, Vacaville. So they make the decision, we're not going to protest. We're okay. just going to let him speak, let the boy stamp his feet, and in a month, no one will even remember he was here. As the date approaches and the provocateur sees he's not getting the response he wants, he starts hinting things on social media, trying to bait a reaction. Psst. Psst. Hey. I'm gonna make jokes about the Holocaust. I'm gonna say Americans <laughs> treated their slaves well. Nothing. That's so literally Matt Walsh. Oh, so he ups the ante. Makes it personal. I'm going to put up pre-transition photos of your trans students. I'm going to out the queer students I've seen on Grindr. I'm going to name which of your students I think are illegal immigrants. Student body's like, bro, do your worst. <laughs> Nobody's falling it. for it until one student's like, uh, uh, hold up. He's going to dox immigrants in front of his audience of white nationalist gun nuts. And we're just going to let him? You know some of his fans were in Charlottesville, right? Yeah, just patriots, brother. They're not Nazis, just patriots. Right? What we're seeing like here the is rooms. a game of chicken between one group of white conservative reactionaries and one group of, let's be honest, mostly white liberals, for whom the stakes are who gets paid attention to. The provocateur doesn't have the ammunition nor the optics to attack privileged liberals directly, so he pokes and prods at various social minorities whom privileged liberals are supposed to care about, until he gets a reaction. Going after people of color is a pure Xanatos gambit for his fans. Either they get a protest and a national audience hears their reactionary rhetoric, or there's no protest and they get to fuck with some immigrants. And because white liberals are largely ignorant to the threat posed to those immigrants, white liberals are not great at assessing the full scope of the danger. This is why if you're a POC or, or part of any, um, you know, marginalized community, you should own a gun. Often enough, this... Just, it's just you should. You, you literally should. To <clears throat> them, an argument about ideas and principles. To them, they are but words until someone gets it. because there is no winning unless you right like that i think that's going to be like the overarching point maybe here that that all right playbook's about to tell us man all right playbook's so good i've never watched all, all their videos but it's so good because this is like one of those unanswered i'm i'm curious as to what you know is said here because it's one of those unanswerable questions right you can tolerate so much and not give attention not feed the machine but you have to give attention because you cannot tolerate those who are intolerant, right? It's a paradox. It's, it's a paradoxal. So because it's divided amongst progressives and liberals and everything, like who, what battles do we fight? We understand that the battles we choose not to fight, they're going to go for the source, right? Like they get to bully some immigrants, like you said. Well, it's like then the immigrants have to know how to defend themselves, right? So it's, it's a super hard thing. It's very, very hard hit by a car or shot, and then it's, who could have predicted? The provocateur's animating force is not hatred of people of color. 
It's hatred of white liberals, just as white liberals' animating force is less advocacy for people of color than moral victory over conservatives. Neither side acknowledges people of color as entities in this fight. They're viewed as tools for getting white people what they want, and their suffering yep. is viewed as an acceptable byproduct. I, I disagree with one thing. The provocateur's animating force is not hatred of people of I disagree with this part. It, I think winning over liberals is just a part of it. Owning the libs is a, is a small part of it. But like having grown up around like not like literally Nazi type people, right? Having seen Nazi people like like very regularly. Nope. They legitimately hate them. They hate people of color. If you're white, they might give you a chance to be fixed. Right. And it, it's not that anything. They just hate these people because anybody who isn't white is going to fuck up the country or their land or their their movement. Right. They think that these people are the biggest threat to their ideology, right? I don't think he's saying racism is a thing, isn't a thing. No, of course he is. He's saying he's racism is just a tool to hold against other people that disagree with them. But I, I don't know, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Color. It's hatred of white liberals, just as white liberals' animating force is less advocacy for people of color than moral victory. Oh, yeah, he's talking about commentators. True, true, true. I guess in the lens of commentators, yeah. Victory over conservatives. Neither side acknowledges people of color as entities in this fight. They're viewed as tools for getting white people what they want, and their suffering is viewed as an acceptable byproduct. You've maybe heard the phrase, in the game of patriarchy, women are not the opposing team, they are the ball. Well, in the game of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, minorities are not the opposing team. They are the cars, store windows, and newspaper kiosks that get wrecked when the home team loses. Up, or when the home team wins. It's the Eagles fan view of oppression. And make no mistake, weaponizing or disregarding students of color is still racism. Okay. But it's racism of a kind most white people have trouble recognizing. or to speak with a sharper edge, that the white people side. often refuse to acknowledge? From the white provocateur who does not hate minorities directly, but is willing to utilize the hatred of others to get what he wants from some white people, who says, I will hurt them a lot just to hurt you a little, to the white liberal who does mental gymnastics to not come out and say, that is a black and brown sacrifice I'm willing to make, racism is not always a passion, but it is... Tolerable. Usable. Easy to disregard. In a white supremacist world, yeah. it is the cost of doing business. Let me make it clear. Nothing about this is okay. Now, the weaponizing of minority suffering is employed against many minoritized groups. I could be making this video about transphobia or homophobia, and while many details would differ... I think he's literally, like, this is what we talk about on stream all the time. This is why we watch like Matt Walsh on stream. This is why we like seek out these fucking crazy people. We seek out people who disagree because uh, it is weapon. You, you need the pushback. Those people already have a platform. I wouldn't even have to change my intro. Samuel R. Delaney, yeah, yeah, take a shot, argues that misogyny is the oldest bigotry and therefore the model yep. on which all other bigotries are based. That's what I said. I'm focusing on institutional racism as my chief example. First, because this is America and the cup runneth over. Second, because in the 2016 election, the greatest indicator a person was going to vote Republican more strongly correlated than being registered as a Republican was racist sentiments. And third... Because racism is a fundamental building block of fascism and a primary means of sowing discord on the left. But we'll get to that. I am going to curb my reflex to make every alt-right playbook some kind of definitive statement. I do not have the last word on American racism. Oh. If you want to hear about American racism from the people who experience it, here's a book. Here's five books. Well, I I experienced it. Anti-white racism. One time, the biggest streamer, just chatting streamer, said the c word. I can't believe it. I've experienced. How are you gonna uh, deny my feelings? A Turkish man called me the c word. What I bring to the table is I have at this point several decades experience being white. 
And in trying to explicate white supremacy, it is sometimes worthwhile to look at it from the inside. Yeah. So my focus will it be... rocked me to my What core. does whiteness mean to white people? American racial discourse has four principal white characters. On the far right end, you've got the guy white people picture when they hear the word racist. Your Klansman... Ludwig. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Your neo-Nazi, your suit and tie ethno-nationalist. This guy knows he's a racist, and he's proud of it. Next to the white supremacist, you've got the white collaborator. The okay. politician, public figure, or businessman who does not agree with the white supremacist on paper, yeah. but will seek out their votes, attention, or money. Next to the collaborator, you've got the white... By the way, the, the white supremacist collaborator is like Dave Rubin, right? That's like a, a perfect example. Or like uh, like Milo Yiannopoulos, right? Like, listen, M Milo Yiannopoulos is a, is a straight-up white supremacist. Don't get me wrong. But they hate him because he's gay, right? It, he's, he's the in but the out. Does that make sense? He's not... He can't be all the way because they would hate him. But he's like, he's a pundit who speaks for them. It's just weird, right? Moderate. People who ostensibly believe in racial justice as an end goal and are somewhat committed to bringing it about, but only with the cooperation of the white collaborator. It wouldn't be fair to do it without their consent, you see, and thus the white moderate spends a lot less time opposing collaborators than appealing to their better natures. They tend to operate on behalf of people of color rather yeah, than Wazda. with Kinda. them. Plainly put, the cost of doing business maneuver is this group yeah, using totally. this group to attack this group using people of color as their weapon of choice. It is white supremacy in the form of three groups of white people fighting amongst themselves. Finally, on the far opposite <laughs> end, you have the honest-to-goodness anti-racist. Yep. Where the racist will support white supremacy, the collaborator uphold white supremacy, and the moderate seek to reform white supremacy, only the anti-racist is trying to get rid of it. And even they are Antifa not free better. from racial bias. And if you tell yep. one of them, you are not free from racial bias, it's not guaranteed they will react well. It's just, if you're trying to fight white supremacy, they're the white folks you have the best odds with. Now, this little chorus line is not how white people typically frame the situation. We usually think of racism as a binary. There are racists, and there are non-racists. In that framing, the provocateur is someone whose allegiance we get to debate. He willingly sacrifices people of color, but without personally hating them. Does that count as hashtag racism? This debate lasts approximately the rest of your goddamn life, which should be evidence enough that the frame is wanting. In today's framing, there are several shades of racism, and there is anti-racism. There is no non. Now before we map the choreography of how these four types interact, first a quick note on how most white people think about whiteness. Short answer, whenever possible, they prefer not to. Whiteness in America. Okay. Is it vanilla? No. It's fior de latte. Nothing but milk and sugar. When non-whites are flavors, we are the base. In the same way one does not hear one's own accent. British people have accents. That's not a lot of pots. But we just speak English normal-like. That's not a lot of pots. If you have not built your whole identity around being... Now that lady had an accent, too. Being white, I heard both of them. You probably don't think about your whiteness very often. And perhaps even feel uncomfortable when one points it out. For it is the white experience to passively, unconsciously, conceive of oneself as a kind of raceless default. This is privilege! Indeed, this is part of what makes- Wait, I just thought, we're talking about, we're talking about white supremacy. Here you go. The globalists, the godless, the atheists, the numbers and the planners and the people who wish to take your life and reduce you to a number, the Marxists, who have always done this. Always. Whether it's Nazism, whether it's Stalinism, whether it's Maoism, they have always attempted to reduce the individual Yo, that God has Any created to a number. That is the point of statists. 
to reduce you down to a single digit, not a gender, not a race. Yeah, but okay. Here's the thing: is you are like that. That's not the goal. That's just called fucking reality, dog. You are one of many. Like I never understood this. How is this an argument? It does not mean you're an individual. It just means you are one of many. It does not mean you don't have worth. It actually means that you have the same worth as other people, right? I I just is literally is not a bad thing, dog. I don't understand. How is that a bad thing? Why do I think I'm more valuable than anyone else? It's privilege, privilege. It's the identity that's treated as a norm. The one you don't have to think about. A movie with an all-white cast is widely perceived as being in no way about race. But that's not true of one with an all-black cast. True. Identities being treated as defaults makes institutional racism difficult to understand even for well-meaning white people. How can I be racist if I don't identify as a racist? <laughs> How could I be part of a group I never opted into? But let us reflect. Would a group one never opted into not describe a minority? People don't choose to be gay, and while people also don't choose to be straight, being straight is normal. People don't come out Whack. as straight or have complex codes for signaling I heterosexuality. <laughs> Not that they'll admit to, at least. I came out as straight. In lieu of other evidence, straightness is presumed. But if people clock you as gay or even think they've clocked you as gay, then you stand out from the background. It makes you more visible, where the appearance of straightness makes you less so. Makes you the everyman. Of the many identities one may have, at any what? given time, on any given axis, there is typically only one default, whose rules operate differently to the rest. The more of these normal identities one possesses, the more accustomed one is to being the default. The idea is foreign, that people might group one not by how one thinks of oneself, but by how one is perceived. Did you guys not sit down in your family and be like, I am straight? And by how one so impacts others. It gets hard to table. fathom that any more than whether or not a light-skinned Mexican gets to be white is up to them. Wow. Whether or not you fit the definition of racist is not up to you. He said he hit the age. The boundaries in that. are not policed from the inside. So, okay. Going again from right to left, this is where we find the titular alt-right. What's novel about the Sutentai ethno-nationalist is how they break from the iconography of racism. Their goal, like that of many racist people, is to attack and oppress people of color, but in such a way that the white establishment lets them get away with it. The average white person's shorthand for a racist is still primarily the Klansman and the neo-Nazi, respectively a rural working-class white nationalism and an urban working-class white nationalism. The alt-right is the gentrification of white nationalism. Their pocket squares yep. and MBAs and $90 haircuts short out the white moderate. This is like James Lindsay. Like James Lindsay is the perfect example of this. Or its brain Fucking because loser. they still associate white supremacy with white trash. I hate that Racism guy. is worse than evil. It's common. It's why they insist reactionary conservatism is propped up by the white working class in flyover states, despite all evidence to the contrary. The alt-right can't be as bad as everyone says of a racist going to Sorry. Harvard. The alt-right bridges the gap between white nationalism and the rest of white culture using class signifiers to gain access to the political and social capital of the more mainstream collaborator and getting the moderate to treat them not as someone to be ignored, but someone to bargain with in good faith. The collaborator finds value in this relationship because, regardless of one's position on it, racism works. A, a police officer may not be personally racist, but when it's the end of the month and they need to hand out a few more tickets to make quota, it's safest to do so in a low-income neighborhood where the average driver can't make their life hell by hiring a lawyer. And due to decades of racist redlining, most low-income neighborhoods are disproportionately black and Latine, so... And a prison warden may not be personally racist, but... White people are approved by jury selection more often than people who think the justice system itself is racist, so black and Latine people are the them. easiest to like jail, them. and private prisons get more funding when they're full, so... 
And a conservative politician may not be personally racist, but black and Latine people predominantly vote Democrat, and since they're disproportionately imprisoned, if the politician denies convicts the right to vote, they're more likely to get reelected. so... I don't know whether the labor unions and their bosses really hate me. That doesn't matter, but I know I'm not in their unions. I don't know if the real estate lobby is anything well, against black over, people, right? but I know the real estate lobbies keep me in the ghetto. I don't know if the, if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks that give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. Now, frequently enough, these people are self-identified, <laughs> card-carrying racists. My point is, for this system of incentives and rewards to operate, they don't have to be. Any of them may, but none of them must. Racism exists, and it's efficient. And in a capitalist society where cops are competing for promotions, private prisons are competing for contracts, and politicians are competing for votes, if an unethical behavior sees a higher return than the alternative, then ethics are a luxury. There are hundreds of examples of businesses that claim, in periods of prosperity, that they prefer to do what is right over what is profitable. But what do they say sure. when prosperity ends? Every boom has a bust. Since 1900, the U.S. has spent one out of every four years in recession. And in the lean season, not using this... But that rhetoric isn't productive. We need civility, civility, and come to the table together with the people that want to erase us from existence and take away our rights. Surely we can have productive convo with them? Nope. It's generations so old system Never works. built by white people to advantage their descendants is a liability. A values-based business typically now. goes one of three ways. Compromising their values to stay competitive, getting bought by someone who compromised their values to stay competitive, or sticking to their guns and facing a higher risk of going out of business. Many choose to do the right thing, and some even survive. But that's beating the odds. The market trends towards the optimal strategy. No one ever went broke appealing to the ignorance of white people. The collaborator treating non-white suffering as the cost of doing business also works rhetorically. The average conservative citizen doesn't know anything about the Syrian civil war. But they know the refugee crisis is something the left seems to care about. So demonizing refugees yep. is mutually beneficial for pundits and politicians who want to rally their base by spiting liberals, and for white supremacists who want to mainstream racism against Arabs. The average conservative citizen doesn't understand epidemiology, but they don't want to blame their own party for letting a million die of COVID, so calling it the Chinese virus is mutually beneficial for pundits and politicians who want to deflect blame onto a foreign nation, and for white supremacists who want to mainstream racism against Asians. And yet, despite this blatancy in collaborating with white supremacists and having eerily similar goals to white supremacists, the collaborator insists that they are themselves non-racist. Their decades of opposing affirmative action, right? Yeah, I'm not racist. I just uphold very racist thing, bro. This is just ugh. once again, I'm reminded of the conversation we had with fucking neo Confederate weirdo. I'm not racist, dog. I just look to support a thing that happens to have a lot of racist roots <laughs> and a lot of uh, very nationalistic tendencies to assembly, police reform, fair voting efforts, redistricting, funding for public schools, prisoners' rights, religious tolerance, shutting down Guantanamo, accessibility for non-English speakers, immigration, investment in low-income neighborhoods, decolonizing school curricula, Indigenous Peoples Day, putting Harriet Tubman on the 20, kneeling, ending the drug war, or withdrawing from the Middle East are framed as problems of implementation. Yes, Tony, stop. We yes, agree stop. with the aim of closing the racial wealth gap, just not like this. We agree with the aim of Latin Americans entering the country, just not like this. We agree with the aim of peaceful protest, just not like this. And if we on the left are to ask, how exactly are we supposed to get this without this? Oh, coming up with that solution? That's our job. And if it's not getting done, it's because we haven't come up with a solution they like yet. And yeah. probably what they don't like about our solutions is that we implied the problem was racism. Yeah. Yes, 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 white people are overrepresented in dozens of industries nationwide, but have you considered that it's a fluke? Pitch me a solution <laughs> for it being a fluke. 
the collaborators' white supremacy exists in the negative space. They agree racism exists. They agree we should oppose it. But they disagree that any individual thing you're talking about is an example of it. Getting a Republican to identify and... Yeah, that's the hard part, right? Is, oh, that's not actually race. That's a culture thing, right? Most common thing you hear is, oh, that's a culture thing. Where the fuck does the culture come from? right yeah or or yeah show me the law right people who deny the patriarchy they always say show me the law that favors men over women it's like well don't you think we have like implied rules maybe not law but implied rules that lead to you know uh unfair outcomes an actual incident of systemic racism is like trying to point at your shadow with a flashlight and it's reasonable to ask Jesus! How far can these guys push the envelope before the rest of the establishment calls them what they are? But if you're waiting for the moment a white moderate agrees mainstream conservatism has done something unacceptably and unequivocally racist, you're underestimating how long white people can equivocate. There's a lot to say about the white moderate, and I'm about to be that lefty who expends as many words complaining about liberals as he does fascists, but... Look, okay. as much as this series is about the tactics of the far right, it is at least as much about how the center left is susceptible to them and complicit. So, okay, when a Democrat loses an election, what happens with the white liberal pundit class? Well, there's... By the way, he's, this is like a really long-winded way to kind of explain the, you know, cut a liberal and a fascist bleed. Liberals, the kind that look for bipartisan agreement, do not want to fix something at the expense of those who already exist. They're, they're a shield for fascism. The best way to explain this is like, oh, Beto's a good one. Beto's perfect, okay? Because Beto does fucking performative shit or Buttigieg. Yeah, Mayo could work too, okay? So either one, you got Beto and you got fucking, uh, you got Mayo, okay? Uh, Mayo Pete, okay? Both of them, or a shield for fascism because think about this beto is the kind of person to always say like we both need to come to the table not all conservatives are bad right you'll hear that all the time from people like beto o'rourke right you'll hear it all the time i'm just against those who like say and do racist things but that doesn't mean that like i'm not going to find bipartisan agreement somehow i have to not realizing that that is shielding the root cause because you really don't because the root of conservatism is like nationalism it, it is it is racist ideology it is upholding an unjust system that already exists which like is a fascist system right a system that will lead to fascism like everyone understands this we understand that there's conclusions right we understand that there is variations but it, you'll get some form of of unjust thing and people like beto stand in front they're like no no no, no. you can't hate all republicans please bro Please, you can't hate all of them and like stands and takes the bullet, bro. You're not allowed to hate all Republicans. You can't hate them, right? I mean, I don't, I don't hate anybody, but obviously I'm going to be this. I don't agree with a single Republican, um, like talking point, right? Like I'm never going to agree with the party, right? He's like, no, 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 you can't, you can't be against our ideology. There's some good ones. We need Republicans. And it's like, shut up, bitch. The fascist will use that as a talking point to be like, look, they're even turning on their own people. It's like. No, bitch. Like he's just as is he's just as bad as you, right? I don't want to go to the table with you. I think there's no reason to go to the table with you. You have rooted beliefs that you for some reason can't shake, based on what, as the all right playbook, you know, clearly stated, is based on 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 conspiracy, right? Things that you just say, nope, that's false, right? Even though it's not, it, it, you've been proven beyond a doubt that it's real, um, and that is why, like. You have to be, you cannot be a moderate. You have to be anti-racist. You have to be anti the system. You have to be anti. And I believe there is like, there is sock Dems who are, there is. But the moment you get anything, even, even a smidge to the right of like a sock Dem, like European sock Dems, they just defend the racist shit. Like they just will stand in front of them. Yeah, you have to be anti-fascist suddenly a lot of chatter about how to talk to your racist uncle over Thanksgiving, about how liberals in red states can contact their representatives, about the value of debate. This is our fault, they say. We let this happen. 
because we didn't have enough conversations with white conservatives. Yeah, there you go. You hear a lot more of that talk than about how the gutting of the Voting Rights Act cost a lot of the left the right to vote, and what could be done to guarantee their representation in the next election. In fact, you hear a lot more about how that kind of talk is alienating to the white conservatives who supported gutting the Voting Rights Act. About how reaching across the aisle is going to mean easing off the race talk, at least for now. POC representation is quickly reframed as a critical long-term goal. But in the present moment, while we are competing for elected office, guaranteeing the minority vote is a luxury. What's prioritized is that the people who suppressed the black vote in order to win elections not be made to feel that they are racist. Because, I mean, what if they genuinely believe the Voting Rights Act unfairly targets southern states? Or even if, and, and, and I'm saying if here, they did do it to suppress votes. If hurting black people isn't their goal and they're just trying to win elections, is that, is that, is that really racist? Moderates are very cagey about breaking out the R-word for a fellow white person. See, there's this other definition of racism that most white people learn in grade school. Racism is when you say mean things to other kids about skin <laughs> color and it hurts their feelings. Racism yeah, is about cruelty definitely. and harm that's done by white is. people. There there's, unironically, that's what every conservative thinks racism is. Purely a skin color argument. Therefore, is not racism... If it isn't cruel, if it's merely ignorant or apathetic. The LSF definition. But ignorance and apathy can be reasoned with. You just gotta sit down and hash it out, as long as it takes. Real white supremacy is about emotional distress or interpersonal violence. It's uncommon, it's unpopular, and it's a hearts and minds issue. What this definition leaves out is any notion that white supremacy is about power. That white people who it's about it's about oppression. It's about who holds the uh, the the cards, right? Racism is a systemic thing. Racism is a uh, is when it's upheld somehow. Disavow racism, still live longer, get paid better, get arrested less often, and are typically in position to negotiate with whomever's in power. That this society was built for the everyman, and being the everyman confers power upon you. When children of white moderates get older and first brush up against this definition, wherein white supremacy is not small, but all-encompassing, where it can be cruel, but is at least as often indifferent, and where every white person in the country is bound up in it and privileged by it, whether they want to be or not, and will never, ever experience it themselves, where it's not about feelings, but about power. How often do they say, oh, maybe the definition I grew up with was simplified for nine-year-olds? Or, oh, maybe the definition given to me by white grown-ups was less complete than one a black grown-up might have given? And how often do they say, you can't just redefine racism? Right out the gate, the white moderate is possessive not just of their whiteness, but of the very definition of racism. In the definition they know, racism exists only over here. And the white collaborator yeah. is a compatriot who shares their ultimate vision for the future. You know how many times you hear like liberal, like Joe Biden, right? Not every Republican is a racist, brother. It has simply gone off course somewhere. Dude, I'm realizing that I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. I'm watching this. Not so much anymore, but I used to be. When I was a little more, a little less left. I used to prescribe myself to the saying that not every Trump supporter is a racist, but every racist is a Trump supporter. I disagree because you're supporting someone who upholds racist things. And they don't see themselves as flawed individuals with a long That's way a still to go. That's a wrong way to think about it. They've already arrived. They're the destination everyone else needs to get to. Living proof that white supremacy can be easily and painlessly opted out of. They can't see collaborators as opponents because there is no definition of white supremacy that includes collaborators and doesn't also include them. And this is critically important. Yeah. They don't want to start thinking of themselves as white. They don't want the constant awareness of one's race and how one's race is perceived. You know, 
the things the rest of humanity deals with. And who would want that? I'll tell you who wants that. Nazis and Klansmen want that. They're the only ones who like thinking about whiteness every day. So white moderates cling to the other definition, the comfortable one. This is the same. He's probably going to talk about this in just a second. I, I think I saw, I, I might have, uh, you know, scrolled ahead a little bit and saw it. He's going to talk about Matt Walsh. And this is the same thing. Bro, this is like with the, the Matt Walsh, what is a woman shit. I don't know if he goes, that was so big. It's so funny because when you Google the definition of woman, it kind of ruins their their idea, right? I want to show you guys something. You Google the definition of woman, right? You have these and you have all these other definition, right? But they just literally do not go down to like another definition. A person with the qualities traditionally associated with females, which means you don't have to be you know, born, you don't have to be assigned female at birth. You don't have to be AFAB at all, right? You don't, you literally do not. That's like part of the definitions. And the reason there's multiple definitions for words is because society changes and things can mean multiple things. They may be more or less. Racism is, it, it, I mean, I, I don't, I, he'll probably talk about it. I think he's getting there. The, the all right playbook. I think they're getting there is um that. Racism is saying mean things to people of a different color than you. It is. That is racism. It's just one of the ways racism exists. Willing to collaborate with people of color, but mostly in ways that don't foreground their whiteness. White as default is one concession that can never be made. In part, because it's the one that can't be spoken. Their ideal is a kind of big tent anti-racism, where victory comes by winning over reactionary conservatives. That might strike you as odd, given that reactionary conservatives have seen many victories over the last 20 years, and it's not like they did it by winning over us. White supremacists bolster their numbers by finding little disgruntled pockets of America that have not heretofore engaged much in politics, and radicalizing them to the cause and then pitching themselves to white collaborators as a demographic now large enough to sway a narrow election. If moderates wanted to counter this strategy, they might look at who out there is sympathetic to progressive causes but isn't voting. Maybe because they don't feel liberal candidates represent them. Or they maybe know. because someone just happened to shut down all the polling locations in their neighborhood. And you know, mathematically, there's probably a lot more disenfranchised people of color who match that description than racist white people who aren't already Republicans. But that strategy would mean doubling down on anti-racist talking points instead of easing off of them. It would mean a willingness to alienate some white people. It's giving up on them. It's admitting that a significant percentage of American whiteness is not on the side of racial equity. So it Michael means if, there's a definition of racism where it isn't fringe, but common and pervasive, and where addressing it requires thinking about their place in it. It means asking why they feel more affinity for white people who oppose them than people of color they claim to agree with. Why the votes of the former have to be earned, but the latter are expected. And since all that seems intolerable, they fixate on the kinds of gestures that feel like moving in the right direction, but run very little risk of arriving anywhere. How about instead of defunding the police, we give them more money than any administration in years, but also Juneteenth is a national holiday now. Something yeah. for everyone. The left has the numbers to leave behind white centrists who slow down anti-racist efforts. And it doesn't because white moderates don't want to. They and the white collaborators are supposed to be in this together. And they are. Just not in the way they think. The irony is that the right feels no affinity for white moderates whatsoever. They hate, and I mean hate, white moderates. Smug pricks always talking about unity whenever they win an election. Reach across the aisle. That's what you say when you've lost and you want the other guys to make concessions they don't have to make. You don't do it when you're in power. Are they trying to humiliate us? Or did we really lose to a bunch of clowns who don't even know how to win right? Debasing themselves in front of minorities just to get their votes when they clearly aren't going to do anything real for them. Christ, at least the white supremacists are honest. 
the right will what? threaten POC sometimes. I mean, I agree. Just but... to call the white moderates bluff. What a con- Racism must be understood as more than a set of individual beliefs and feelings, but as a it's tool not wrong. for no. achieving political ends. First and foremost, because claiming otherwise is both factually and morally wrong, but also without this understanding. White culture can't recognize the stakes. Fascism exists in a state of permanent conflict. Things like declaring an indefinite state of martial law, suspending elections, or executing members of government are justified on the grounds that the people are in danger and need to be protected. The people, the white people. Mobilized. Now, this isn't unique to fascism. Between the Cold War, the War on Drugs, and the War on Terror, The U.S. has been in some form of ongoing conflict for the last three generations. But you'll note the Cold War didn't end on a battlefield. It ended when the Soviet Union collapsed in on itself. Communism, terrorism, and drug dealing are patterns of behavior, and they wax and wane, often for reasons outside our control. Geopolitics may someday shift such that terrorism becomes less prevalent, or that lowers the demand for drugs. Communism can be fought with diplomacy and economic sanctions because communists can choose not to be communist anymore. And fascists have no use for soft power. To justify a military dictatorship, they need an opponent that won't just go away on its own one day. It always comes back to identity politics. Later, Mikhail. Because black people can't stop being black. Theirs is a number that will not be reduced without the hard power of violence and displacement. Fascism begins by stealing targets from the left. They focus on elites, corrupt businessmen, weak-willed politicians, subtly shifting focus away from leftist critique of systems yeah, to types of people. But sooner or later, they settle on something unchangeable. Race, gender, ethnicity, religious background. The bigotry is localized to the region's existing prejudices. In Nazi Germany, it was Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, Roma, Slavs, black people, queer people, and people with disabilities. In fascist Italy, it was Slovenes, until Mussolini invaded Libya and Ethiopia, and so demonized their citizens as well. In the U.S., the Klan and the American Nazi Party targeted African Americans, Jews, Catholics, queer people, and immigrants. Spain under Franco tried to determine the exact racial makeup of the Spanish people so they could cast out those with the wrong mixture of bloods. Uh, This is why the far right has gone all in on transphobia, by the way. Like, it's joined Islamophobia on the outer rim of acceptable bigotries. On some level, they know trans folks aren't just cis people in disguise. That desistance is rare and conversion therapy doesn't work. Because if trans people could just stop being trans, they never would have picked them for an enemy. This is where it starts. This is why you should have no patience for anyone saying wokeness is dividing the left. We should be focusing on class. They're not attacking us on class. They're trying to sell themselves as better on class than we are. Where do you think that fairy tale about blue collar whites comes from? They want you to believe that they, and not the socialists, are the path forward for the downtrodden. There's a reason fascism... Yeah, I mean, that's... uh, He pretty much said it, but that's the reason they hijack, like, left talking points, right? That's why the reason they jack, like, worker movement talking points, because they want to appeal to the worker. They want to appeal to the everyman while not seeming hateful, or to disguise the hate. Fascism started popping up all over Europe right after the Russian Revolution. Mussolini got his start beating up socialists in the Po Valley on the grounds that he was defending not wealthy elites, but struggling rural farmers who didn't yeah. like the socialist takeover of their industry during the Bienio Rosso. The fascist goal is yeah, to agree, harness on, and redirect class resentment towards a scapegoat. They come at us on identity. It always comes down to the shape of the human skull. When a provocateur shows up on a college campus to talk about ideas, it's not a debate. There's no special sequence of words that will defeat them. This is a show of dominance. They are presenting themselves as white compatriots to be reasoned with, rather than agents of white supremacy to be opposed. In that framing, the stakes are attention, the weapons are words, 
And people of color are not players, but tokens on a white person's game board. And they are checking whether you will submit to that structure. They don't care about ideas. They care about power. And power is what beats them. They tell you 400 people showing up to protest is just free news coverage. But when 4,000 show up, they cancel. That's power. And in absolute numbers, most yep. events, they can't rustle up 4,000 supporters. But we can, provided cishet, non-disabled, white dude lefties like myself haven't told all the right's biggest targets that their struggles don't matter. And it's worth mentioning, cops fuck with protesters less when some of them are white. It's also worth yep. mentioning racism affects 58% of the working poor, so there can be no class solidarity that doesn't address it. This isn't who needs to win. This is who needs to win. And if you're white, you need to be over here. I've collected as many resources as I can find by POC on what they need and want from white allies and put them in the down there part. There's a plurality of opinions on this, so I recommend reading more than one. And it may not always be a 4,000 strong protest. Every direct action is unique and must be strategized in concert with the people most affected. But what I can tell you is when business gets done, White folks need to split the check. A movement cannot be anti-fascist if it isn't anti-racist. What a good video. That was a really good video. When was the last All Right play? But holy fuck. Also, look at all these different sources, dog. What a good video.